Hey everybody, this is Dr. Mark Hyman. Welcome to the Fat Summit, your chance to separate fat from fiction. And I'm here with my uh, new friend and colleague, Dr. Asim Alhotra from London. And uh, he's really one of the leading thinkers in cardiology, challenging the status quo around fat, around calories, around the conventional wisdom, around statin use. And it's sort of shaking up the scene a bit. Uh, and it's very impressive. He's uh, He's doing a whole campaign against sugar and consumption in, in the UK, and he's an award-winning cardiologist. He's an honorary National Health Service consultant, and he's uh, really pushed doctors and the media and academics to rethink sugar, rethink fat, through his articles in British Medical Journal and Open Heart and many others. And I've, I've followed his work very closely, and I've been very impressed with his conclusions, which uh, you know, I have to say, are pretty much the same as mine, so <laughs> I kind of like it. But welcome, Dr. Malhotra, and uh, welcome from London. Thank you, Mark. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today. So I want to start off by asking you, how did you change from being a conventional cardiologist who was trained that low-fat diets are the right way to go for preventing heart disease and that statins are God's gift to mankind <laughs> and that uh, you know all calories are the same to flipping all those ideas upside down and having a totally unconventional view about the world of fat, heart disease, calories, statins, and the whole, the whole thing? Yeah, Mark, it's a very good question. I think the first thing to say is my, uh, I've had a bit of a journey in the last few years, and there's been an evolution in my own thinking uh, as I've read more and more around the science. But where it started for me, Mark, is I'm traditionally trained as an interventional cardiologist. So, you know, what I was trained to do, what, what's my passion is, is treating people with acute heart attacks, with emergency angioplasty stenting. <clears throat> Um, and one thing I uh, was very aware of during my career in the last sort of 10 years or so is I noticed there was a, certainly a, a big issue around obesity. Mm -hmm. uh, in the UK, as you probably know, we are now officially the fattest nation in Europe. Oh, um, congratulations. We're just slightly behind, well, yeah, <laughs> slightly behind the United States. Um, and, and nothing seemed to be, you know, we didn't seem to be finding any solutions. The problem seemed to be getting worse. Um, and I was seeing a lot of patients as well with a lot of increasing burden of chronic disease, multiple comorbidities. And I thought, you know, I started to look into it myself and thought, well, I want to do something about this because, you know, um, I'd rather, um, you know, someone didn't jump into the river in the first place rather than me having to save them from drowning. Right. Um, so for me, I, I, I kind of got an interest in this whole area initially at, through looking into obesity. But as I um, looked into it more and more, uh, and realizing, obviously, this is a food environment problem, I then went yeah. into more detail and looked at the science. Um, and I, and I, I was, you know, surprised initially, but then my view became more and more um, sort of uh, sort of cemented, really, that, that this low-fat message actually has caused harm. It's not even a question of it not being linked to heart disease. It's actually caused harm because, um, at the very least, the food industry have, have utilized this low-fat, <clears throat> it's good for you, by adding a lot of sugar to yeah. a lot of processed foods that are marketed as healthy. And, um, and we know that sugar now, you know, the more and more studies coming out implicating sugar um, as an independent dietary risk factor for many chronic diseases. And, uh, you know, so that's where it kind of went for me uh, to start off with. So you sort of had a, an in, in, in sort of insight when you were treating patients because did you see metabolic changes that you didn't add up for you around sugar and their diets? and Yeah. Metabolic Mark, you're absolutely syndrome. right. Well, you know, so we've had this obsession with cholesterol. Everything's yeah. been about low cholesterol. And I used to see a lot of people that were overweight and a bit or obese whose cholesterol levels were completely normal. And they were somehow reassured that their diet was fine, even though they were overweight. Yeah. And, um, and then I started to look into that and realize actually, you know, that it actually the cholesterol profile, we should have a more nuanced approach. You know, people should be looking more at the triglycerides and the HDL um, rather than just concentrating on, on LDL or bad cholesterol. Um, but also the fact that data started coming out showing that actually 75% of people admitted with myocardial infarction yeah. had normal cholesterol levels. Now, the other aspect of it well, is... Well, that, that was, just to pause for a minute there, that was yeah. an impressive study of 500,000 patients. It was like 60 or 70% of all the patients who had, had a heart attack in the United States. When they went in the hospital, 75% of them had normal cholesterol, quote, normal LDL cholesterol. Yeah. But, but what was also interesting in that group was that most of them had low HDLs and high triglycerides, right? Sure, absolutely. absolutely. So what does that You're mean? actually right. <clears throat> I think, I think the, the figure was about 66% of those patients had um, metabolic syndrome, essentially, markers of metabolic syndrome. And if you had metabolic syndrome, you're admitted with a myocardial infarction, you're 50% more likely to either be <clears throat> readmitted, readmitted or die within one year. Yeah. 
So that obviously clearly was a, a mark of, of an adverse health outcome. And by um, the way, therefore, don't statins actually make that worse? Don't they cause well, diabetes well, and metabolism? Well, it's very, very good point, Mark. So now we know, and you know, it, it varies in terms of what study you look at, but approximately one percent minimum, I would say, of people who take statins over a period of only two or three years will develop type two diabetes because of the statin. Mm. And I think that's crucial because then you start looking into, okay, well, what are the benefits? And when you look at the data independently, uh, independently analyzed, if you're at low risk of heart disease, as in you have a less than 20% risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years, there is no mortality benefit. You're not going to live one day longer. Um, mm -hmm. At the 10% level, we know that you have to treat 140 <clears throat> people for one person to prevent a non-fatal heart attack or stroke. So then we're now saying, well, you're more likely to get type 2 diabetes. And that's even before we get into the whole issue about side effects that interfere with the quality of life, right. which we know, you know, vary from, depending on various reports, but vary from at least what we'd say 10 to 20 percent. Um, and, you know, that, that really changes the whole, the whole, our whole perception about the use of these drugs and the benefits patients are getting. And then to add, to add more fuel to the fire mark, how many patients are actually told that in the conversation when they're having a discussion about taking stands. Every Nobody. single patient thinks they're going to benefit. <clears throat> yeah. um, and therefore, in my view, we, are, we have an epidemic of misinformation around fat, around sugar, around statins. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's dig in that a little bit. So with the, with the fat uh, and the metabolic syndrome, because that's really the key here. What you're basically saying is that when you're a cardiologist and when you look at the data, most of the people coming in with heart attacks have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Like that's the driver of heart disease for most people. Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> it's not necessarily LDL cholesterol. No, absolutely. And I think there was a, we had a publication recently in the Postgraduate Medical Journal. It was a very good paper in one of the diabetes journals from a few years ago. And they actually give a hierarchy in terms of what are the most important risk factors <clears throat> behind heart attacks. And actually, insulin resistance comes up number one followed yeah. by hypertension, high blood pressure, yeah. um, then BMI, and actually LDL cholesterol comes lower down. So even then, if you, if you take the published data at face value, and you know, there is certainly, there are some question marks around publication bias, as you know. Yes. Um, even best case scenario, um, you know, LDL is a risk factor for coronary artery disease, in my view, at best is really a much weaker risk factor than people believe it is. Yeah, I mean, and it doesn't seem to be as, as strong, for example, as the total cholesterol to the HDL ratio, right? Sure, absolutely. And that, in fact, when people do their cardiovascular risk assessment, when you plug in all the different variables from your body mass <coughs> index, to your family history, to your blood pressure, to your sex, to whether, you know, you've had a history of angina, you know, um, you know when, you, when you plug it all into in terms of your risk calculator, um, actually, it's a total cholesterol to HDL ratio that's, that's actually key. And, that, than and what determines that, right, is the HDL is determined by your metabolic syndrome. In other words, if you were pre-diabetic or if you have a high sugar refined carb diet, that drives HDL down. Absolutely. And, Mark. and Again, so what, the, and what causes it to go up is? Well, you know, interestingly, saturated fats. <laughs> exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, there are other so... factors. Exercise is one, but <clears throat> certainly saturated fat tends to drive the HDL up. And you've hit on a very important point there, Mark, is that <clears throat> you know, one of the explanations for why when we look at the high quality observational data now, where that link between saturated, and fat, heart, saturated fat consumption and heart disease is being questioned, one of the mechanisms is that the HDL goes up um, as much as the LDL, and therefore the ratio doesn't change that much in terms of your overall risk. So therefore that may be another mechanism um, to explain why saturated fat isn't truly the cause of heart disease. But to, to further that argument, Mark, <clears throat> what many people don't realize is that actually there are many different types of saturated fats, mm -hmm. and they have you know different chain lengths depending on which food they're found in. Um, and to try and simplify it, a very good Cambridge Medical Research Council uh, study that was, was done, two studies, in fact, mm. in 2014, uh, very good high-quality observational studies show that actually it's suggesting now that if you have full-fat dairy in particular, so we're talking about full-fat yogurt and cheese, the saturated fatty acids that are found in those foods are actually linked to reduce, reducing yeah. the risk yeah. of type 2 diabetes and heart disease which may actually explain the, what we call the French paradox. So we know yeah. that in Europe, <laughs> so the French have the butter, highest huh? consumption of saturated <laughs> fat. And I can tell you as a cardiologist for you know, several years that whenever we used to have meetings and conferences, there would always be like France was the gold standard, that so we need to get our cardiovascular mortality rates down 
as low as France. <clears throat> Um, and they're having and, you know, and which cream, is interesting, right? and it, yeah, well, it may well be. You know, it's certainly one of the factors in my view. There's no doubt. Yeah, no, I, I remember seeing some of the analysis where they looked at plasma levels, blood levels of fatty acids, and when they stratified the types, which you could tell from what you're eating, like you could tell the type of fat, margarinic acid, for example, is a saturated fat from dairy. Yeah, people who had high levels of that had lower risk of heart disease, which I thought was pretty interesting <laughs> in the data. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such a it's such a mind bender because most of us have grown up thinking that saturated fat is bad, and still, even though total fat levels are being questioned as being useful, uh, even in, in America and the new dietary guidelines committee, they're still saying we should stop eating saturated as much saturated fat, and that we really we shouldn't we shouldn't be eating so much of it. And that, yeah, how do you yeah. explain that? How do they kind of and 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 you know they well, say it's inflammatory. They say it it actually. So. I think they're still sticking to the hypothesis, Mark, that mm. saturated fat increases co cholesterol, total and LDL, and that's a risk factor for heart disease. So for them, it, they probably, you know, they feel it's a, a, a no brainer. Oops, sorry. For them, it, they feel it's a no brainer. And they probably still think, OK, well, we'll err on the side of caution here until we have more and more data. <clears throat> you know, to be honest, I think we have the data already. And in fact, one of the things I would suggest is that we should probably move, move towards more food-based guidelines rather than concentrating on macronutrients. But certainly, you know, there shouldn't be a restriction on total fat. Uh, and in my view, I think the saturated fat message, I think it's, it's been grossly overblown. And, uh, and, and I certainly think there is you know, good nutritional value and, and very likely protective effects from full-fat dairy. Yeah, so that's interesting. So as a cardiologist, what, when would you recommend someone address their cholesterol, their LDL cholesterol. If, I mean, because as you start taking more saturated fat in your diet, your yeah. LDL cholesterol goes up, your yeah. total cholesterol goes up, and people start freaking out, and they go to their doctor, and they go, your cholesterol's up, this diet's hurting you, stop it. Meanwhile, they're feeling better, they're losing more weight, everything's yeah, working, cool. but how do you, like, how do you deal yeah, with that? Yeah, no, very good question, Mark. <clears throat> I think what I, again, coming back to what we look at is, well, let's look at the total cholesterol to HDL ratio. I mean, I'll be very honest, I, myself, you know, I haven't calculated the amount, but and I will do that soon, but I probably have quite a high consumption of saturated fat um, in my diet. And I've checked my own cholesterol levels, and I can't remember the absolute numbers, but there's been a slight increase in my LDL, but my HDL rocketed. And yeah. in fact, what's interesting is, and it, you know, and it varies from individual to individual, you know, I think one thing we need to, I think, appreciate more and more is that one size doesn't fit all, and there may be individual variations. And sometimes an oversimplistic <clears> message <throat> that one <throat> size fits all, in fact, as we know, has caused damage. But yeah. What I would say is that, that my actual HDL rocketed, my triglycerides went down, my total cholesterol actually went down, and my ratio got better, even though I know I'm eating more saturated fat. So, um, and, but what I did do is I reduced my refined carbohydrates and yeah. sugar consumption. <clears throat> yeah. And I think that, in combination, actually was, was beneficial as well. So, you know, I wouldn't, and, and again, in terms of my weight, and as you know this, you know, a diet that's higher in fat, certainly much higher in fat than what we currently recommend, the government guidelines are recommending, and lower in sugar and refined carbohydrates is, in fact, going to be better for your metabolic health, for your weight. And, you know, and the other aspect of all of this, Mark, is if you look at the, uh, the randomized controlled trial data we have, and, you know, there is, of course, there is, you know, is a paucity of data, but we still have some good data. Certainly, the be the beneficial effects of diet on risk of cardiovascular, not risk, just in fact, outcomes of cardiovascular, uh, you know, uh, endpoints, whether it's um, heart attacks or mortality, is certainly one which is much higher in fat yeah. than current guidelines. So for mm -hmm. me, the, you know, it's a mess. It's yeah, a complete it's mess. A mess. The current diet guidelines in the United States and the UK, in my view, are a root cause of the obesity epidemic. So our government's killing people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can look at it that way. It's certainly, certainly contributing to a lot of misery, well, it's, you know. It's, it's fortunately, an, 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 and I'm sure I'm completely unintentioned, but yeah. I think we need to correct it. Yeah, it's an unintentional, inadvertent consequence of our dietary guidelines, both in the United States and the UK. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to sort of uh, tip off now to a really compelling article that you wrote uh, in Open Heart with Dr. Nick Antonio, uh, yeah. looking at calories as a myth uh, in terms sure. of both weight and heart disease, and you brought up some very compelling evidence from the DART trial, from the PREDIMED trial, from the GISI trial. So you looked at different studies that were very well done studies challenging our beliefs that all calories are the same and even brought up studies that show that you could reverse heart failure by a very high fat diet and reverse sure. diabetes by a high fat diet and that they actually led to more weight loss, which 
it was just kind of interesting. So could you kind of take us through that article and the thinking behind it and uh, some of the studies? Because it's really sure. compelling. We can dig into it. Absolutely, Mark. No, that's, that's a really good point. So I think so. the, the title of the article was um, <clears throat> It's Time to Stop Counting Calories. You know, dietary changes can rapidly and substantially reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And, and there's, a, there's a few different messages there. So let's, if we start with the calories aspect, you know, one of the issues that people forget is that different calories have different metabolic <clears throat> effects on the body. So one example is if you are to have 500 calories, four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil per day on top of a relatively healthy diet. That's like 500 diet. calories of olive oil. 500 calories. <clears throat> and, you know, Mark, to be honest, I probably have much more than that in olive oil. I probably have six, seven, maybe eight teaspoons a day somehow, yeah. either in my cooking or whatever else. If you have at least four tablespoons, that's significantly associated with reducing from randomized control trial data the risk of heart attack and stroke. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have 150 calories from a sugary drink, typical yeah. of a can of cola, yeah. we now know that's strongly associated with increasing the risk of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So clearly the calories have different effects on your body, even in, so in terms of health outcomes. But then you add in the other aspect of it, as you well know, is that fat calories are, are also mm -hmm. the, the foods that have high fat have the least impact on glucose and least impact on insulin. And insulin is a fat storing hormone. So, so when you eat fat, it, it doesn't increase insulin or blood sugar, right? It, yeah, very minimally, you know, in comparison to protein and carbohydrate, carbohydrate being the worst. So <coughs> that's another aspect. And then you've got to add in the fact about feeling full. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the actual so-called, so, you know, I think this calorie in, calorie out, you know, I think this has benefited the food industry and, and actually the focus has been wrong. I mean, one of the other aspects is, the so-called idea of maintaining a healthy weight. I don't think yeah. there's any such thing as a healthy weight. There's a healthy person. Right. I don't well, think that was, that was interesting in your articles that, you know, even without changes in weight, there were dramatic changes in risk and heart attacks if yes. they actually ate more fat, like olive oil, nuts, and so forth. Absolutely. And, they're, and even without dramatic changes in their lipid numbers. So in other words, yes. your heart attack went down, your risk went down, even if you didn't lose weight or your numbers didn't get better because something else was going on. Absolutely. And that you, you've touched on a really important point there, Mark. So that was subgroup analysis from the PREDIMED study. And actually, we know now that the, the benefits <clears> of the dietary <throat> changes are independent of, of kind of total cholesterol, independent of body weight. You know, these are kind of the anti-inflammatory, if you like, properties of these yeah. foods. And basically, it's reducing your risk of, of, of in layman's terms, thrombosis, plaque rupture, coronary artery, you know, um, occlusion. And that's probably the most likely mechanism for this. And uh, those, and we, those no, were not lay terms; those were medical terms. <laughs> no, no, sure. So, 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 na so narrowing within the arteries that yeah. develops before people have heart attacks <laughs> when they have a sudden blockage, as you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, basically reduce the clotability of blood. I think yeah. is a way of kind not of everybody listening. It. This is going to be a doctor. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. No, absolutely. So what I would say is those foods are medicinal literally yeah. medicinal. And uh, so that's where the outcome benefit is there. And that's the other aspect is, you know, there was something called the look ahead trial, yeah, which was, was looking at people who are overweight, you know, <clears throat> and trying to reduce. So the focus was either lowering weight through just calories, lowering calories overall. Uh, and then, you know, uh, was it a low they fat found, intervention? It was a low fat intervention. Mm. And actually over, you know, over 10 years, there was no benefit in hard outcomes. They had no, no reduction in angina, no reduction in cardiovascular event rates. They lost weight, yeah. but then there was no outcome benefit. So the question then is, okay, fine. You, of course, you know, and I know if you people overall these, reduce these the amount of people who were like pre-diabetic, right? This was Absolutely. a group in the study. So they, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is just to yeah. kind of give people a background on this. It was like a $500 million study, big yeah. intervention, was yep. going to be the holy grail of like lowering calories, lowering fat, and pre-diabetics to look at outcomes. And what you're saying is there was no difference in the risk of heart attacks or strokes or yeah. death. With intensive lower, lifestyle. With yeah, really and despite doing more lifestyle. exercise as well. And they lost weight. Huh? So it depends actually how you lose weight, right? Exactly. It depends how exactly. you lose weight and what the metabolic effects of what you're eating are. And Complete. that study was based on the kind of diet that we all believed was true because it was designed many, many years ago and it's sort of outdated sure. in its design. So that was fascinating to me that, you know, you didn't see that change. Yeah. So what I would say is focus on good health and the weight loss will be a side effect. Don't focus mm. on the weight loss mm. and focus on the good health and all these different <clears throat> things that you can do, especially dietary changes. So, so I want to dig in a little more into that article because a couple of things you said really struck me. One was that, you know, it takes decades to develop heart disease but it takes yep. months to reverse the changes you see. 
And then you yeah, can get so that, really so rapid that, things like with the DART trial or the Gissy trial, other trials. You saw it wasn't like you had to do this for 10 years to see a benefit. You talked about three months. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at the, <clears throat> the interventions and you look at the, the data, the lines of separation between the control and the intervention in some of these studies where people were, had a heart attack and they were advised to eat fatty fish versus ones that weren't, you see the actual um, the benefits start to happen very quickly. I mean, they probably start within weeks and, uh, you know, you can see those benefit within months in terms of people's event rates reducing. And I think that's really extraordinary because the perception mark, as you know, out there is, OK, I've developed, you know, heart disease takes decades to progress or develop in terms of the the, the buildup of these fatty deposits, if you like. And in the arteries, it mm. leads, leads <clears throat> to narrow. Yeah. Um, but people then think, well, that reversal of that process of reducing the risk of of, of, of events from from that development of the of the coronary artery disease will also take years, and the and the answer is actually no, it's much quicker than people think, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's a really important message to get out there, and it comes back again to that thing about food being like a medicine. You know, the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates, said, as you know, you know, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food, and he was absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it can be a poison or it can be a medicine, as you sort of Absolutely. ended your article with. I mean, that's that's really the, the sort of power here is that eating badly can quickly screw you up, but yeah. eating well can quickly fix you up. And, yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's really compelling. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying, so the other side of it, you're saying eating badly. So uh, there was a good study in The Lancet showing that people who ate fast food more than twice a week, you know, had a significantly increase in insulin resistance and inflammatory markers. And that happened within weeks. Mm. So high sensitivity CRP went up, so, you know, and it's probably from the, you know, the trans fats, probably the refined carbs, the mm. sugar, all of that combined, you know, that has actually a pro-inflammatory effect as well. So conversely, the, the kind of, as you say, the poisonous aspect onto the body on, on foods is certainly there as well. And that happens quite quickly too. Yeah, in functional medicine, we talk about food as information, right? So yeah. it can be exactly the same calories, but have different instructions for your body. So like Absolutely. you said, if you eat trans fats in the studies you quoted, they calorie for calorie would increase inflammation, increase heart attacks, increase risk. Whereas if you eat omega-3 fats or olive oil, the opposite happened, calorie for calorie. So it's, fa it's really fascinating to think about that. And you, you know, all the, the sort of evidence together seems to point in this direction, but you've still got large groups of people saying that you know, saturated fats are bad, that we should be using high dose statins, that we should get LDL down as far as possible. How, what do you say to those people? <laughs> I'm sure they're your colleagues. Is, is sort of our no, challenge. sure. Well, I just say, let's just be transparent with that information. If that's the case, so let's actually look at the evidence as it is. Show me the evidence that suggests that what you're saying is, is going to cause a, a hard outcome, negative hard outcome, or you know, going to cause a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, and with the, in, case of, in the case in point of statins, Mark, as well, one of the things that I wrote about separately is about us being shared decision-making with patients. Rather than it being binary, you must take this pill. Yes. I think we need to evolve, Mark, to a position where we could say to patients, you know, and this gives them that freedom of choice and to say, OK, if they come to you and say, doctor, should I be taking the statin? You look at their risk profile. You say, well, with the evidence we have, as I said earlier, if you're low risk, or otherwise healthy, you know, you're not going to live one day longer. You mean low risk if you don't have high blood pressure, if you're not overweight, if you don't have diabetes, if... You yeah, well, even some people that might have some of these risk factors still may be overall less than 20% risk of cardiovascular. And there's, is there a questionnaire that you fill out or a risk calculator that you recommend to help people assess that risk? Well, the Q Risk 2 calculator, which people can go on uh, online, you can find it for free. Doctors use it, and that can give you a risk of, of heart disease, so cardiovascular disease. What, what's, the, what's, the, what's it called so people can look it up? Yeah, so if you just Google Q Risk 2, Q -risk so Q, Q. Q Risk 2, just Google it, and yeah. it will bring you up a... Uh, you know, you can put in variables and, and it gives you a calculation quite easily. And it looks at things like your height, your body mass index, yeah. uh, your blood pressure, your co race, recent cholesterol profile, whether you're a smoker, your age, that kind of thing. And it gives you a risk profile. But, you know, it's quite clear and a very <coughs> good way for people to remember if it's less than 20 percent risk yeah. of developing heart disease in the next 25, you know, 10 years. Then in terms of mortality, cause a lot of people will have different questions they want to ask. Like, OK, well, how much longer will I live from taking this pill? And the answer is you won't live one day longer. Mm. according to the published data. Now, there is a small chance it will reduce the risk of you having a heart attack or stroke. There's no doubt. But you're actually more likely to get type 2 diabetes. Okay? Yeah. And then, then if you go into the higher risk groups, Mark, and just to simplify it, people with established heart disease where 
the benefits of statins haven't really been questioned, and I'm not questioning them. But even then, the absolute benefit in terms of mortality, in terms of it's death, not that great. is one in 83 yeah. over five years. So that means mm-hmm. 82 out of the 83 people who have had a you know established heart disease who take a statin are not going to benefit in terms of mortality. Yeah. So you know, I think we and you know this is really important, empowering it's, information. So the especially when and people over-promise and deliver with that drug. Well, exactly. <laughs> well, people get side effects, so then they're worried about stopping the pill because they have this perception, or they're told, right. "Don't stop your statin, otherwise you could die." Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's complete nonsense. Yeah. You know, I mean, in terms of you know, it's the risk is so small, and then you get into the the question is, well, how much longer will I live, doctor? Well. You know, another analysis in BMJ Open recently, which I'm sure you've seen, showed that if you don't have established heart disease, over five years taking a statin will prolong your life by three days oh, on average. Wow. And if you do, it's going to prolong your life by six days. So I think people deserve to know that. I would want to know that. <laughs> yeah. I would want to know that you if know, I was going to take this pill. There's, um, there, there, there's a, a father, one of the fathers of biochemical individuality, Roger Williams, says there's liars, there's damn liars, and there's statisticians, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, Absolutely. It, and there's a book I, I saw from years ago, it was called How to Lie with Statistics, right? It's, it's, it's cool. interesting how we spin it. And the drug companies are very good at spinning that. I mean, so they say, oh, you have a risk reduction if you have had a heart attack from, you know, 30%. Well, that means you've reduced your risk from 3% to 2%, which sounds not as good. That's an absolute risk reduction of 1%. Absolutely. So it sounds good when you say 30%. It doesn't sound so good when you say 1%. Yeah, Mark, and actually you raise a really important point here, even around medical ethics, because um, the director of uh, risk literacy in, um, of health and risk literacy in, uh, uh, in Germany, a guy called Gerd Gigerenza, um, and you know, he is a spokesperson even for the World Health Organization, and you can look this, people can look this up if they, if they like. Um, he basically said it's an ethical responsibility for both doctors and patients to understand the difference between relative risk and absolute risk, to protect mm. patients from unnecessary anxiety and manipulation, yeah. in quotes. Yeah, that's pretty funny. How many doctors have a conversation with their patients in absolute risk terms? You Tell know what, me. I, I would say that, you know, when we graduate from medical school, I don't know about your medical school, but there wasn't a lot of education about how to read research. There wasn't a lot of statistical no. analysis or understanding no. relative or absolute risk or statistical power or study design or observational sure. versus RCTs versus case control studies. I mean, they're, they're just, we didn't get that education and it took me a long time to begin to understand how to look at the research intelligently. And even if you are educated, which, and most doctors are just so busy practicing, they don't have time to really think about all this. They just hear the headlines like everybody else. And it's kind of frightening to see how, how doctor, most doctors don't really understand how to look at the literature, look at the funding, how the study was designed, what the intent was. I mean, it's, there's so many issues around it, and, and it's challenging. I think, you know, I, I, I was talking to Walter Willett uh, as part of the FAT Summit, and I have a lot of respect for him. He's really uncovered a lot of things from his observational research. But he said, you know, that saturated fat study that was done by Chowdhury, which was this, you know, big meta-analysis of randomized trials, observational data, he said, well, you know, it didn't show any link between saturated fat and heart disease, but also it was in the background of a diet that's high in carbohydrates. So he said, well, if you, we don't know what happens if you take out the carbs and you take out the saturated fat and switch it for polyunsaturated fat like omega-6 oils. Is that better? He was sort of implying it was. And he really, I want, I want to talk to you about this because I, I think this omega-6 issue is really yeah. quite interesting. And, you know, there's omega-6 naturally found in nuts and seeds. And, I mean, most foods are complex combinations of Fats, right? Olive oil Absolutely. is tw- olive oil is twenty percent saturated fat, so it's not yeah, like it's some all. Some olive oils do have that, yeah. So, so, but but when you take out the refined oils from seeds and vegetables, and you get these high, super high levels of refined omega six fats, and the quantities we're having are so much greater than we used to, is that a concern for you? Because that's what. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, uh, so but, but like, by the way, but the reason I'm asking is that most of the um, cardiology associations and recommendations are to increase those fats and, yeah, and sure. I'm, I'm wondering what you think about that well the first thing to say um mark is that actually there is a danger but it's again how you lower your cholesterol again lowering cholesterol shouldn't be the end in itself it should be your health your health ultimately and if the cholesterol happens to be lowered fine but the first should be your health outcome now there was a study published in the bmj in 2013 which actually uncovered unpublished data from the sydney heart study yes. which was done you know several decades ago and what they found was that cardiac patients who replaced butter with safflower oil containing margarine, which was high in omega-6, despite having a 13% and despite having a significant reduction in total cholesterol, had increased mortality. 
And um, wait, wait, the wait let me just stop they, you there. So what you're saying is they reduce cholesterol by having more yeah. omega sixes, but their yeah. heart attack risk went up. Absolutely, the actual yeah. event, the actual heart attacks went up. The actual event rate went up. Their mortality, in fact, not just heart attacks, their death rates went up. Wow. I mean, you can't get it's more like heart outcomes. There's no bias there. percent increase, right? It was serious. Absolutely. Yeah. Significant increase there. Absolutely right. And the mechanism, the postulated mechanism is that omega-6, too much omega-6 actually could be pro-inflammatory on LDL subparticles. And that's interesting. And, and James Dinicola Antonio, who you mentioned earlier, has, has written a paper in that, on that as well. Uh, and, you know, the evidence is quite compelling on that as well. So that makes so it's how you lower your cholesterol. Really, mm, it shouldn't be. I don't think that should be the primary focus mm. it should be just the fact that you should be concentrating on the evidence base for foods that are good. You know, and I think I suspect Walter Willett, when he's talked about the polyunsaturates, they focused on cholesterol because we know that if you take high polyunsaturates, it lowers your LDL, it lowers your LDL. But, you know, but what does that actually mean? You know, and uh, as far as I'm aware, there are no hard outcome data showing that lowering LDL through polyunsaturates actually improves, you know, stops you having a heart attack. So, yes, this is a this is the whole issue around risk factorology. And this is how yeah. the drug companies have also yeah. you know, marketed so many drugs very successfully. You focus on one thing. Now, just because if you lower it by that mechanism doesn't mean that it's going to be beneficial for you. Right. Even if that's a risk factor. Right. right. Like, right. When, uh, for example, it's like they, drugs for HDL. We know that right. drugs that increase HDL have never shown any outcome benefit. But we know having high HDL um, which happens as a consequence of having whatever, you know, certain foods probably yeah. Yeah. is going to be, you know, it's just more of a biological, uh, natural way of raising your HDL as opposed to using a drug. So um, we have to really think very differently about this, all of this in yeah. health. Yeah. So what you're saying is in the studies where they found if you cut sugar and increase fats, your HDL goes up, you do better. But if you actually reduce it by taking a drug, you die. <laughs> right. Well, that, you know, that's the really good point. That's, that's a really the, good point. And, yeah. and Mark, on, on that note, other than statins, you know, there are lots of drugs that have been produced over the years that have lowered LDL cholesterol, but have never shown an outcome benefit. So it's only statins that have done that. And the same with randomized controlled trials where, you know, uh, there's been, I think, a half a dozen of those. And again, I think James and Nicola Antonio and Zoe Harkin were involved in a paper yeah. on this, showing there was no evidence to suggest that randomized control tri from tri randomized control trial data before the change in dietary guidelines, reducing saturated fat, actually improved benefit. And, um, yeah. and I think that the, uh, you know, the, 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 the LDL cholesterol was lowered. Uh, with people reducing saturated fat, but there was no outcome benefit. Now, the same thing applies to the drugs other than statins, which then goes on to, which I wrote about in my BMJ article at the end of 2013 called Saturated Fat is Not the Major Issue. Everybody should read that. It's great. Yeah, the, actually, the, the, um, the, the benefits of statins are probably independent of cholesterol lowering. They're yeah. probably some inflammatory uh, effect, yeah. not through lowering right. cholesterol, in my view. Yeah, well, I think that brings up a good point. I mean, the, the statins have... Uh, quote, an unintended side effect of being an anti-inflammatory drug. They, they, yeah. they inhibit something called nitric oxide synthase, and it actually reduces inflammation, also has antioxidant properties. And we know antioxidants and anti-inflammatories help reduce the drivers of heart disease. Sure. Uh, but what's interesting is, and this I want to ask you about this, Dr. Ritker's data from Harvard, he looked at big studies where they found people who had high LDL, but no, no inflammation, they didn't seem to have a risk reduction by taking a statin. But those people who had high inflammation and high LDL, they seem to benefit from taking a statin. Did you, do you know the, those data? Yes, absolutely. I think Jupiter <clears throat> also showed that, didn't That's it? right. That's the trial I'm talking about, the Jupiter trial with Dr. Yeah. Ritker. And, you know, that was striking to me is that if you have a high LDL, but you don't have inflammation with a high CRP, then that's a C-reactive protein, a marker of inflammation, then you, then you don't really have risk. So the question is, well, how else can you lower inflammation besides taking a statin? Are there better ways? And, you know, I was Absolutely. impressed with your articles because you, you talked about other ways of having an anti-inflammatory diet, lower sugar, refined flours, more omega-3 fats. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely, right. Mark. No, you're absolutely spot on. And I think this is it's very interesting, this whole area and debate. And, uh, you know, you know this, is, this has been the most lucrative marketed drug in probably the history of medicine. Yeah. And a lot of vested interest behind it. It's a multi-billion billion dollar industry from statins um so i think you know understandably um there are very powerful vested interests that aren't necessarily going to like what we're telling them mm, so true <laughs> it's so true it's pretty it's pretty frightening and you know i think e even with all the reading i've done and all the research i've done i i still like have this question in my mind about ldl and my if my ldl has gone up from you know 80 to 120 because i'm eating more coconut oil 
should I be worried? And I'm like, there's family history of heart disease. And even though like I, I try to intellectually sort of frame it, there's, there's, we've all been sort of brainwashed in this way, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're right. It's very difficult. And yeah, it's ingrained within us. So there is that extra fear and you just, you just wonder. There is that bit of doubt, you know, obviously people would, would worry. But again, I think, you know, I would look at the whole profile, really. Mm. Um, and uh, if your HDL has gone up, your trigger, triglycerides have gone down, your overall profile is, is either the same or better. Um, and again, the other thing, Mark, to mention is I think that, you know, it's quite clear that LDL as a risk factor is much weaker than what people think it is. Yeah, right. Um, and certainly as you get older, you know, there's an inverse association. So over the age of 60, the higher your LDL, the lower your risk of death and cardiovascular death. Yeah, that that brings up another point, which is in in older patients, should we be using statins? Does it make sense for them? Yeah. yeah. In my view, I think we have to be very cautious with older patients yeah. um, because I think, as you know, older patients are also more vulnerable to side effects as well. well, uh, I, well polypharmacy I, and the risks of polypharmacy. So some of the data that I saw was sort of fascinating on statins is that even independent of elevations in muscle enzymes, which is what you typically see as a side effect if it's causing muscle damage, when sure. they do muscle biopsies. The, the muscle cells are swollen, the mitochondria are damaged because cholesterol drugs block an enzyme that also produces CoQ10, which is necessary for proper energy production in the cell. So sure. that's kind of concerning to me, independent of actually any symptoms or independent of elevations in muscle enzymes. It seems like almost everybody who takes a statin has some level of mitochondrial injury. Yeah, no, it's interesting. So um, Beatrice Galom. Um, she uh, she's an American uh, physician based in I think San Diego if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. and uh, and she's done some work on looking at statins effects in women in particular, mm. um, because you know there is a, a, an understanding and belief first of all in a lot of the statin trials there are very few women involved, mm -hmm. um, there are pre predominantly men, and the question is do women benefit and you know she she's certainly done some research suggesting that women don't have the same benefits. Even you know, even those small benefits that men do yeah. from taking statins. But what's interesting, she did a double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial looking at low to moderate dose statin intake versus um, uh, people who are taking a placebo. Mm -hmm. And what she found, up to 40% of those uh, people, the, the females taking it within a few months, reported reduced energy and fatigue on the statin. Yeah, which is fascinating. You know, it's a high number of, of, of people, mm -hmm. and that's probably the commonest side effect you see is people just feeling. A little bit listless, having reduced energy. Obviously, the muscle pain is is more common, but yeah, that that that's certainly concerning, especially yeah. when we have a lifestyle related to diseases. You want people to be kind of being motivated to do more exercise, not less, right? Right. So the the um, the other thing I want to jump into before we close is this idea of exercise. And uh, with the statin connection, I remember reading a study that they took two groups of overweight people, gave one of them a statin, the other one didn't. They put them on a twelve week intensive exercise program. The ones without the statin actually improved their fitness level with exercise, but the ones on the statins did not. Actually, they're, they're, they weren't able to get fit because their muscles weren't able to respond to the exercise. Do you remember that study? And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I know that I, it, was quote, um, it was cited by John Abramson, the BMJ, <laughs> yeah. uh, public health professor at Harvard. That, yeah, that makes absolutely. me worried. So, so let's talk about exercise. You, you've written about how exercise isn't the be-all and end-all that we think it is. You know, when, when, yeah. you, when you hear the message, eat less, exercise more, and the food companies say, well, it's all about exercise, just exercise more and you're going to solve this obesity epidemic. Like, do you think that's yeah. true? Well, I think there's two things to say. In the broad perspective, so looking at the broader picture, when you look at the Lancet Global Burden of Disease reports in terms of the 10 leading risk factors for disease and disability and death worldwide, um, poor diet now contributes to more disease and death than physical inactivity, smoking, and alcohol combined. combined. Okay, so wow. in terms of hierarchy, diet is the, the key. Now, when we look at obesity, you know, it's very clear to me, Mark, that actually, when you look at exercise and obesity, there's very little link, if anything. I'm not saying exercise isn't good. We know exercise has many benefits, there's no doubt, whether it's reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes or high blood pressure or cardiovascular disease. Or dementia. But when it comes yeah. to weight loss, weight loss is not one of those benefits. Yeah. You know, the obesity epidemic is 100% driven by the types of food, stroke calories, types of calories people are consuming, not to do with exercise. Therefore, if the focus is to improve the statistics on obesity, then it's going to be through reducing the uh, consumption of the foods we talked about earlier um, and having more fat, certainly, in the diet.
Yeah, no, I've but seen exercise this is not going to be the be all and end all. And in fact, in some ways, it can be harmful. So, you know, even anecdotally, I can tell you, and there are studies to show this, that exercise, as you know, can for a lot of people be very powerful appetite stimulant. So the worst case scenario, which is actually a reality of what happens, partly because of the messaging and the branding and the advertising, is people think, OK, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go on the treadmill and work out for 20 or 30 minutes, go for a run. And then I'm going to go and then I'm going to go to McDonald's. Treat myself, and, right. Absolutely. <laughs> and actually, that's harmful because not only because of the even if you take the calorie theory, you know, at face value and you're so-called keeping a healthy weight. We know that about 40 percent of people with a normal body mass index will harbor metabolic abnormalities that people with obesity have, yeah. whether it's high blood pressure, or insulin resistance. And there is now more and more data to suggest that even if you exercise and you're a normal body weight, if you eat you know, pardon my language, crap, Yeah, you're going to still increase your risk of getting these adverse health consequences. So, you know, by yeah. all means, exercise, but it's use diet, the right diet, 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 and then exercise. Get the right, right. fuel in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's so, it's so key. All right. Well, we have a few minutes left. I want to get into another aspect of what you're doing because, you know, you're not just a cardiologist. You're not just reviewing the research. You're not just talking about the role of diet and health. You're actually doing things as a political activist, which I think, you know, most doctors don't really own. They don't think that they're domain includes public policy, our food policy, our media, and, and the way the industry uh, uh, you know, drives disease. So we, you're working at the earlier continuum of disease rather than waiting for people to get in your office. You're trying to solve the problem upstream. And you have something called uh, Action on Sugar, which is a lobby group. Sure. You're involved in the documentary on this. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so um, when, you know, for me, the, I've had an interesting journey the last few years around trying to get the messages out into the mainstream media through the BMJ and through articles in The Guardian and the Daily Mail, etc., about the, the harms of sugar and why we need to address it. And um, after I wrote an article in the BMJ in May 2013, which is called The Dietary and Advice on Added Sugar is in Need of Emergency Surgery, basically saying that the current food labeling, the messaging was actually encouraging excess sugar consumption. We need to do something about it. Mm. Um, I got contacted by a guy called Graham McGregor, professor of cardiovascular prevention um, in, uh, in London. And he had done a lot of work over the last you know, decade plus or so in reducing salt consumption in the UK across the population. And uh, he wanted to do the same thing about sugar. So we mm -hmm. basically set up a group of international experts. Mm. Robert Lustig was on, oh. is on there. Yoni Friedhoff, you may know. Yeah. Uh, a guy called Richard Johnson. So we got a group of experts together and basically formed a, a, a kind of a lobby group to try and pressurize the government and the food industry almost simultaneously to ensure across the population we get a reduction in sugar consumption. So one of the recommendations we said is that we need the food industry to be regulated so they gradually, over the pace of time, time scale of about four years, in all foods basically reduce the, the amount of sugar they add by about 40%. Mm. And from the calorie theory, <laughs> that's been calculated to be enough to stop and probably reverse the obesity epidemic if you just stick to the calorie theory. Yeah. But you and I know the benefits are going to go beyond that. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we're doing. We're also called for a sugar tax, sugary drinks tax. So we're really pressurizing the government and you know we've got lots of experts and people are also they listening? Who are, Is the government listening or the interest to Well, they're under a lot of pressure actually Mark over here and, and, and I don't know if you're following it, but you know the media is all over this and there's almost competition between newspapers now to put <laughs> study to, to put pressure on, you know, the government on, on sugar, which is amazing um, and you know people are having it's, it's making people angry especially when people are realizing how they feel they've been misled on the labeling when they know now the World Health Organization recommends a maximum upper limit for adults of six teaspoons of sugar a day, a day right. or about 24 25 grams of sugar yet we know the average UK citizen mark is consuming at least two to three times that amount at least, and yeah. children much more right. so I think once people have, have realized that and how they've been misled people are getting angry and the public now you know, surveys are now showing that more than half of the British public are supporting a tax, calls for a tax on sugary drinks. Amazing. Uh, which is, you know, which is extraordinary. So I think things are moving, certainly. So, you know, I'd finish in saying that there are three, there are things that, that have worked with tobacco and reducing tobacco consumption over the last two or three decades. In public health, we call them the three A's, looking yeah. at the availability, the affordability, and the acceptability. Yeah. And certainly, we're, we're definitely winning the battle on the acceptability. Now, what we need to do is target the availability of these sugary drinks yeah. and sugar. Uh, and the affordability would be increasing the price, like with tobacco. The yeah. price went up with cigarettes. Consumption went down. And Mark, as you know, 
the, the most important factor in driving reduced cardiovascular mortality death rates in the United States and the UK has been through reduction in smoking. Yeah. Not, through, not through medications, right. reduction in smoking has had the biggest impact. So we need to see the same thing happen to get across the board people's diets improving. And I'll leave you with another interesting statistic, which so I looked sugar, into sugar looking at the high... new fat, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and the other interesting thing, statistic for the American population, which we mentioned in our paper, is, uh, you know, based upon high quality observational studies and the randomized controlled trials. And, you know, we know it's not perfect science, but as good as we've got, if the whole of the American population were to increase their consumption of nuts by yeah. one to two portions a week, yeah. it's been calculated within one year that would prevent 90,000 deaths from cardiovascular That's disease. That's unbelievable. Just a couple of hands of almonds and then you absolutely 90,000 well, deaths. That's impressive. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, these are the messages drugs. we need to get out there. You know? <laughs> wow. Well, I wish we could talk for a few more hours. This has been an amazing conversation. And I encourage people to look up Dr. Malhotra's work and read his articles and keep, uh, keep in touch with what he's doing because he's making big inroads. And I'm coming to London in a few months. I'd love to get together with you, hang out and brainstorm about how we can uh, disrupt the system a little more. Mark, I very much look forward to that. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for having me on. Okay. Thank you.